let's go through the bones of the hand because we need to know them in order to understand where muscles attach. So first of all, there are carpal bones in this region here. Carpus is Latin for wrist, so here at the articulation of the radius and the ulna with the carpal bones is the wrist joint. There are also metacarpal bones, so meta means next to, in between, or in addition to. So the metacarpals are next to the carpal bones. They would be next in line as we are moving distally. And last are the phalanges. There is a proximal, intermediate, and distal, unless we're talking about the thumb. In that situation, there's only a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. So again, the carpal bones, because carpus in Latin is wrist, we know that when we're talking about the carpal bones, we're discussing the wrist anatomically. So let's begin first constructing a good way to remember. So first, so think of the eight carpal bones as two rows of four. The proximal row from lateral to medial is the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, and then immediately above the triquetrum is the pisiform. The scaphoid and the lunate articulate with the distal radial head. In the next row, we have the trapezium, the trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. When I was in anatomy, I created a couple of ways that helped me remember these bones. I like to think of the thumb, so this is the thumb here, as a trapeze acrobat. So it's kind of swinging off the hand in this direction because it's very unique. It's not like the other four fingers. Just like a trapeze acrobat, it's a pretty unique job to have if you're in the circus. The carpal bones that hold the thumb in place are named the trapezium and the trapezoid. The trapezoid has a very unique shape in that it looks kind of like a trapezoid as well if you're having trouble remembering these two. The scaffolding or the scaphoid for this trapeze acrobat, the thumb, which is associated with the trapezium and the trapezoid, so the scaffolding is the scaphoid, which is here, directly below the trapezoid and trapezium. Lunate means moon in Latin, and as you can kind of see here, this is the most similar to a full moon if you were to see one in the sky, and that's why they named this bone after the moon. Pisiform here is a very unique muscle because it is the only one of the carpal bones that sits on top of another. If we rotate the image, you can see that it's directly on top of the triquetrum. Pisiform in Latin means P. So from this angle, it kind of looks like a P, and that's a great way to remember it. Pisiform, P, directly on top of the triquetrum. The capitate is always going to be under the third metacarpal, which is our middle finger. A unique way to remember this is that if you're pulling the trigger of a gun and you're capping someone off and you're using your middle finger, you're going to be using the finger that is directly distal to the capitate. Triquetral, or triquetrum, means three-cornered in Latin. So if we turn this around, we can see how there is one, two, three corners. You have to use your imagination a little bit there, but that is why they named it the triquetral bone. From here, it gets much easier as we move distally. So we reviewed the eight carpal bones, and now we'll move more distal to discuss the metacarpals. The first metacarpal here denotes the thumb or the pollux. There are five metacarpals, and all you have to do is count from one to five. So one, two, three, four, five. Those are your metacarpals. Next is going to be the proximal phalanx of the thumb. Now what's unique is that the thumb only has a proximal and distal phalanx. If you look at the other fingers, there's a proximal, intermediate, and a distal phalanx. That is a very high yield principle that the thumb does not have an intermediate phalanx. Only the index, middle, ring, and pinky have intermediate phalanxes. The thumb is also unique in that it is not shown here, but right here in this area, the articulation of the metacarpal and proximal phalanx, there's going to be a, a sesamoid bone sitting in this area here. All right, so we will resume with the muscles of the hand. Let's examine the thenar muscles first. So thenar means palm of the hand and pollux means thumb. That's an important term to know because we're gonna be talking about muscles in this area of the palm that move the thumb. So first up is the abductor pollicis brevis and the flexor pollicis brevis. They're sitting on top of the opponent's pollicis Right here. The median nerve innervates all of these thenar muscles. 
The other muscles that are innervated by the median nerve are the two lumbricals here, the first and the second lumbricle. As you can see, they arise from the flexor digitorum profundus tendon and insert on the extensor hoods here of the index and middle finger. Last but not least is the adductor pollicis. It has an oblique head denoted here and a transverse head. Obviously the oblique head is oriented obliquely and the transverse head has fibers that run in a transverse orientation across the hand. Now let's shift our attention to the hypothenar compartment. Here's the palmaris brevis that arises from the flexor retinaculum and it sits on top of the hypothenar muscle compartment group. So if you remember the names of the thenar muscles, an easy way to understand the muscles that move the pinky or the most minimal digit, hence the name digiti minimi, all you have to do is take the names of the thenar muscles and replace pollicis with digiti minimi. And this makes a lot of sense because we're not talking about the pollux or the thumb, we're now talking about the most minimal digit. So the hypothenar muscles are the abductor digiti minimi here, the flexor digiti minimi brevis, and the opponent's digiti minimi. Next up are the interossei muscles. There are palmar and then there are dorsal interossei muscles. Essentially, they run in between the metacarpal bones and control abduction and adduction of the fingers. They are all innervated by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. First, let's talk about the palmar interossei. So the palmar interossei, there are three. They attach on the fifth, fourth, and second fingers after originating from the metacarpal bones of the same fingers. Here's the third palmar interosseus, the second palmar interosseus, and the first palmar interosseus. They are adducting or adding the fingers two, four, and five towards the midline, which is why they originate from the second, fourth, and fifth metacarpal bones and insert on the proximal phalanx of the same finger that they originated from. Now, the dorsal interossei, there are four instead of three. These are bipennate muscles, which means that they have two elements compared to the palmar, which only had one. It was one single pennate muscle. They do the exact opposite. They abduct, so abduct fingers two through four away from the mid finger or the midline. I remember this because dorsal and abduct both only have one D in the name. So now let's shift over and examine the arteries. So there are essentially two arteries that will be supplying the hand, the radial and the ulnar. We'll start with the radial. So the radial artery obviously runs along the radius and the ulnar artery runs along the ulna. So before we get into the complexity of this vasculature, let's keep something in mind. There are arches that ensure that blood supply will come from more than one artery. So, that it, so for example, if we cut a vessel, we do not immediately compromise blood supply to the hand. This is why the ulnar artery and the radial artery share the responsibility in making three palmar arches. That there is a palmar carpal, superficial palmar, and deep carpal arch. In addition, there's one dorsal arch. We can see how initially the radial artery will give off a palmar carpal arch, a superficial palmar branch, and a dorsal carpal arch. All of these tell you where they're going. The dorsal carpal arch is on the dorsal aspect of the hand. The palmar carpal arch is on the palmar aspect of the hand and it is near the carpal bones. And the superficial palmar branch is on the superficial aspect of the palm. As the radial artery continues, there's going to be more branching here at the angle formed by the first metacarpal and the second metacarpal. The first proximal branch here is the first dorsal metacarpal artery. Next is the arteria radialis indices, which by the name tells you that it will supply the index finger here. The radial artery also gives off another branch, which is the arteria princeps pollicis. The arteria princeps pollicis will then split 
to become the proper Palmer digital arteries that supply the pollux or thumb, hence the name Arteria princeps pollicis, the principal artery that is supplying the thumb or the pollux. The radial artery will terminate, so you rotate this image, and we see here that it terminates as a contributing branch to the deep palmar arch. And you see here is the superficial palmar arch, and deeper in the hand is the deep palmar arch. Now let's examine the ulnar artery. Just like the radial artery, the palmar carpal branch off the ulnar will contribute to making the palmar carpal arch here proximal to the carpal bones. Next, you're going to see a dorsal carpal arch coming off the ulnar artery that will supply the dorsal carpal arch that unites with the contributing branch from the opposite side from the radial artery. As we continue into the hand, the ulnar artery is going to split into a superficial and a deep branch. As you can probably derive from the name, the superficial branch of the ulnar artery is going to contribute to the superficial palmar arch. As you can see, it is uniting with the superficial palmar branch of the radial artery to form the superficial palmar arch of our hand. Very similarly, the D branch of the ulnar artery is going to contribute to form the deep palmar arch. Here's the deep palmar arch. The ulnar artery is sending a contributing branch. And then the radial artery also sends a contributing branch to complete this arch. So now we've discussed the, so now we have discussed the palmar carpal arch, the dorsal carpal arch, the deep palmar branch of the ulnar and the radial that forms the, so now we have discussed the palmar carpal arch, the dorsal carpal arch, the deep palmar arch, and the superficial palmar arch, all formed by contributions by the radial artery and the ulnar artery. In summary, there are superficial and deep palmar arches in the hand, both formed by the radial and ulnar arteries. The superficial palmar arch is more distal and closer to the surface of the skin. It is superficial to most of the structures of the hand. The superficial palmar arch will give rise to all four of the common palmar digital arteries. So coming from the superficial palmar branch are going to be common branches, which are the common palmar digital arteries, which will continue to contribute the proper palmar digital arteries. So they're the arteries that supply the palmar aspect of the digit. And on the opposite side of the hand, on the dorsal aspect, the dorsal carpal arch will send individual dorsal metacarpal arteries for the second, third, fourth, and fifth digits. Remember that the index finger was rather unique in that it had a first dorsal metacarpal artery that came off the radial, and it also had a arterial radialis indices that came off the radial artery as well.